Today I'm going to begin a story called The Garden, an Allegory. This is also by Cousin Kate. Her name is Catherine Douglas Bell. She lived between 1818 and 1861 or two and wrote several uh, Christian faith stories. This one I think is, is very special. Uh, it is uh, her writing style I really like and it's kind of, uh, of a struggle to read it and read it out loud but uh, that's what I'm going to try to do today and I hope you enjoy this. Oh mama I am so hot and tired, cried little Henry Danvers, coming into his mama's drawing room and throwing himself on the ground at her feet. I have been working all this time in the bright sunshine, and now I am so hot and tired, I don't know what to do. Better sit still a little to rest, don't you think, answered Mrs. Danvers with a pleasant smile. Yes, but then I have nothing to do while I am resting, he said, discontentedly. I am too tired to draw or to mend my whip, and I have no nice book. Mrs. Danvers considered for a minute and then said, Do you think this would be a good time for us to look at the large picture? At the new picture Papa sent from London, Mama, exclaimed Henry, springing up with a face full of animation and delight. I guess I should read that with more feeling. At the new picture Papa sent from London, Mama, exclaimed Henry, springing up with a face full of animation and delight, and from which every trace of vexation and fatigue had disappeared. Oh yes, Mama. Do let me fetch it. I am not quite sure, Henry, said his mama, smiling. Papa bid us wait for an opportunity when you might be well disposed to think seriously about it. And it, this is a story to really, really think seriously about and maybe stop it and go back and study it. This could be a good Bible study. She, by the way, Cousin Kate, I'll stop right here for a second. When she writes, she puts a lot of Bible verses in, and I guess this must have been during a time period when they did not reference chapter and book. At least she did not reference uh, chapter and verse. But you can tell when she is uh, writing from Scripture, she does put quotes around it. Now when a little boy is in a discontented temper, he is seldom inclined to think about anything except his own grievances. But Mama, I shall be quite contented if you will let me look at it. You know I can have no grievances to think about if you give me such a pleasant occupation. And you think that we are not bound to be contented unless we have everything we wish for? asked Mrs. Danvers archly. <clears throat> but her question was unheeded by the eager boy. I may fetch it, Mama, mayn't I? Look at that contraction, mayn't, M-A-Y-N apostrophe T. I know where it is, on the lowest shelf of the bookcase, and see, the door is open, so I can get it nicely without troubling you. This was evidently no time for a lecture upon contentment, and Mrs. Danvers gave the desired permission. What a great big picture it is, Mama, and how nicely it is rolled up round this roller. Don't untie it, dear. Bring it as it is said his mama, rising to clear away some of the books on the round table so as to leave room for the large print. Upon the ottoman, mama, 
cried Henry, and then I can see it from my little stool, and you can look down upon it so comfortably from your own chair. And I can place your workbox here upon the end of the ottoman so conveniently beside you. That will be quite a comfortable plan, won't it, Mama? And while his mama was unfastening the string and unrolling the picture, he bustled about fetching his own stool, drawing in Mrs. Danvers' chair, and arranging everything so comfortably as he said. At last all was done, and he could sit down and feast his eyes upon the beautiful picture that was spread before him. It was the representation of a beautiful garden, in which there seemed to be everything to excite pleasure or admiration. Soft velvet grass, beautiful flowers, luxuriant fruit trees laden with smiling fruit, and large evergreens, whose somber color and somewhat formal outline contrasted pleasantly with the lively green and graceful drooping forms of the birch, I'm not sure how to pronounce this, laburnum, and acacia. There was a bright blue sky overhead with small silver clouds and so beautifully and naturally was the picture drawn that Henry half fancied he could smell the rich clusters of roses, could feel the light breezes that played among the leaves or could hear the song of the birds and the hum of insects as they flitted joyously from flower to flower. Henry was delighted and amused himself for some time in pointing out to his mama, <clears throat> now this gay plot of flowers, now that beautiful apple tree, this cool shady walk, or that sunny bank of bright green grass. At last he said suddenly, but Mama, I don't understand what Papa meant by thinking about the picture. What am I to think about? About the story connected with it, said Mrs. Danvers. So there is a story about it? And you know it, Mama? He cried joyfully. Oh, that is all that it wants to make it quite perfect. So please, Mama to tell it to me. I suppose it is about these little boys who are working in these gardens and playing about on the grass. They seem to have got little gardens of their own just as I have. Yes, it is about these boys. They all live in that beautiful garden. They remain there, some for a shorter, some for a longer time, according to the pleasure of their father who has placed them in it. At a certain time, he will send a messenger, first to one, then to another, and whenever the messenger comes to any boy, he must immediately obey the summons and go away. Where to, Mama? Where do they go? Mrs. Danvers made Henry observe that the garden was surrounded on all sides by a very thick wood, and in one side of the garden wall she showed him a door, by which she said the messenger led the boys into the wood. The door stood a little open so that Henry could see that this wood was very dark and gloomy, and it seemed as if the light of day never shone on it. I should not like to leave this bright, sunny garden, Mama, he said. To go into that dark wood, does the boy's father live there? No, my child, says Mrs. Danvers, answered seriously. He lives in a palace. So beautiful, so glorious, so full of every pleasure that the heart can imagine. 
that this garden, which you so much ad admire, looks dark and dull in comparison. But every boy must pass through this dark wood before he can reach his father's palace. Oh, but if they have only to pass through it in order to get to their beautiful home, they won't care for its darkness. Perhaps they might not if they were sure of going to their father's house. But that is not the case. When their father placed them in this garden, he gave each a little garden to dress and take care of, not merely for amusement, as your garden is, but as a duty which he positively commanded them to perform. He gave them of the same time, at the same time, a book containing plain and particular directions as to how they were to manage these gardens and what plants he desired them to cultivate. Each boy, after he has passed through the dark wood, will be brought into the presence of his father. This book of directions will be opened, and along with it another containing a full and correct account of the state of his garden. If it be found upon comparing these that he has obeyed his father's directions, his father will acknowledge him as his son and will receive him into his house to dwell there forever. There he shall forever rejoice in his father's presence and love. There his occupations shall all be exactly what he shall most delight in. There he shall be ever learning new lessons about his father's glory and goodness. There not one single thing shall be a wanting which can add to his happiness. Not one single thing shall ever happen to vex or grieve him. But if, on the other hand, it be found that he has disobeyed his father's commands, that he has preferred his own amusement and pleasure to the performance of the duty that his father laid upon him, that he has forgotten to consult the book of directions or has willfully chosen to cultivate plants which it forbids or to neglect those which it recommends, then he shall be cast into a fearful, gloomy prison house where he shall dwell forever in terrible pain and misery. There he shall never know one moment of happiness, and there not one single thing shall be a wanting which can add to his misery and despair. Oh, but mamma, cried Henry eagerly, you know they would be so careful to obey the directions and not to be sent to that prison house, and then it is pleasant to work in a garden. It was not as if their father had given them a very hard, disagreeable task. It might not be so easy as you imagine to do all that was required, dear Henry, said Mrs. Danvers gravely. Every plant must be found in a perfect state of health and beauty, and not one single weed, however small, must be seen. Every plant perfect, not one weed, repeated the little boy thoughtfully. Oh, mamma, that would not be easy. You know, one cannot work in all parts of the garden at once, and perhaps when one was busy at one place, weeds might be growing up or something happening to injure the plants in other parts. Only if they knew exactly when the messenger would come, they might by being very industrious <clears throat> and careful, have it all right just for once. No one can know that, my dear boy. Sometimes he will come 
in a moment to the very boy who least expects him. And then whatever be the state of his garden, he must go away at once. At other times, where he sends a warning that he will come soon, the boy perhaps gets frightened and cannot work properly, or he has lost his book of directions, or his tools, or he has not time or fit opportunity to repair the mischief his former carelessness has caused. And besides, their father keeps his eye always upon their gardens, marking down in his book every little circumstance that happens. And if it but one weed and if but one weed have been suffered to grow, but for one hour then the boy must lose his place in his father's house, and be cast down into the fearful prison house. In addition to all this, I must tell you that the soil of these gardens is naturally hard and barren, and while the most hateful weeds grow there readily and luxuriantly, there is not a single good plant natural to the soil. Oh, mamma, then they must all be lost. Not one of them can ever go to the beautiful palace. Is there no way to save any of them? asked Henry earnestly. Mrs. Danvers laid her hand gently upon his shoulder and looking seriously into his face. She asked him if he could not answer that question himself, if he did not know what the story meant. Henry considered for a minute or two and then said in a low, solemn vo tone, It is an allegory, Mama. Is it not? The Father means God. Yes, Henry. And the garden? This world, Mama. But the boy's garden, I don't quite understand. They mean our own hearts, dear Henry, in which God has commanded us to cultivate those graces that are pleasing to him and to check those evil things that are hateful to him. You have read the text. Their soul shall be as a watered garden. And now, Henry, can you answer your own question? Do you know of any way by which poor sinners can be saved, even although they have neglected and disobeyed their father's commandments? Yes, Mama, he said gravely, because Christ has suffered the punishment that we have deserved, and if we believe on him, he will save us. And God will not look at our sins, but only at his holiness. But please, Mama, tell it all tell it all on tell it all on in the allegory, as if I did not know it. And tell me about these boys too, Mama. Here's one such a pretty garden with such a pretty garden. Surely he has done right. Surely he has allowed no weeds to grow. No weeds, Henry? Could mine be a true allegory if that were the case? Is there any man upon earth who has done quite right? Who has ever done wrong? Who has never done wrong? No, mama. You have taught me that the Bible says there is none righteous. No. Not one. Yea, yes, Henry, and the Bible is God's own book, and every word of it must be true. The Bible is the book of directions, is it not, Mama? Please go on and tell me all about this little boy with the pretty garden. What is his name? Did he take care to read the book and to follow its directions? His name is Felix. He did not always remember to take care of his garden or to obey the directions of the book. At one time, 
He was a giddy, light-hearted little fellow, not caring much about anything except his own pleasure and amusement. He spent the whole day in playing with his companions in strolling through the pleasant walks or in lying on the soft velvet grass, enjoying the bright sunshine, the beautiful flowers and fruits, the sweet song of the birds, the gay hum of the insects as they fluttered past him without one thought of the duty which he owed to the kind father who had given him so many pleasures. Boy, and it hits me right between the eyes. He read in the book every morning and evening because he had got into the habit of doing so. Yeah. But he never felt any earnest desire to learn from it what his father wished him to do. In general, his eye ran over the words without any attention to the meaning. Happens to me a lot. Or, if he were sometimes amused and pleased with the many interesting stories which it contained, he yet never thought of asking how they applied to him or what lessons they were intended to teach him. The glowing descriptions which it gave of the love and goodness of the Father and of the glories and pleasures of his house sometimes attracted his attention and made him think that it might be pleasant to go and live there sometime or other. When he was quite tired of the garden and of the pleasures, of its pleasures, but he never considered that he had no right to expect that his father would admit him into his house afterwards if he did not choose to obey him while he was in the garden. And about the prison house, Mama, did he ever read about the prison house? Yes, and sometimes he was startled and alarmed by what he read and by the thought that his garden was not in good order. And then he would resolve to be very careful and diligent for the future. But these fears were soon quieted. He soon began to persuade himself that, after all, his garden was, as well as those of his neighbors, nay, perhaps much better, that some of the required plants were there, and that on their account his father would forgive the absence of others. He had some good plants then, Mama. Yes, some such plants as affection, kindness, contentment, and desire to oblige others. But they had not the proper kind of root. <laughs> For you must know that in these gardens the roots had a different name from the plants themselves. And sometimes several different plants sprung from the same root. These flowers in Felix's garden were fair and pleasant to look upon, but their root was natural affection, and in order to please the Father, they ought to have sprung from a root called desire to do his will. Such as they were, however, Felix was quite satisfied with them and felt quite sure of being admitted into his father's house. And so a whole new race of weeds sprung up in his garden, called conceit, presumption, carelessness, security, and their root was trusting in self. One day, while Felix was, as usual, amusing himself with his companions, a tall, powerful, gloomy-looking man suddenly appeared by his side. His name was Sickness. He laid his hand upon Felix and said, You must not play any more. You must stay with me. And his hand pressed so heavily that Felix could not resist him but was forced to give up his walks 
and games and remained still by his side. At first, he was not much concerned at this, for his young companions came beside him and brought him flowers and fruits and told him stories to amuse him. Besides, Felix really had a good deal of contentment growing in his garden. And that makes a boy tolerably happy in almost any situation. So some days passed very quietly. Felix amused himself as he best could and was quite unconscious that sickness with his strong hand was gradually drawing him nearer and nearer to the Lord, to, to the, not to the Lord, oh my goodness, to the door leading into the dark wood. At last, one day be, he happened to turn his head in that direction and was quite alarmed to see near how near it was. He looked away from it immediately, tried to persuade himself that he was not nearer than he had often been before, or often before been, and resolved to amuse himself and not to look around again. But his alarm, or not to look around again, but his alarm had been too lively to permit him to keep his resolution. It was in vain that he tried to think of something else, tried to forget all about it. Whichever way he looked, the open door, the dark fearful wood seemed to be before him. And when he again glanced fearfully round, he could no longer deceive himself. He certainly was much nearer. He struggled to throw off the strong hand which held him. But alas, all his efforts could not loosen its grasp in the least. Closer and closer it drew him to the door, which seemed to open wide to admit him. Poor Felix was in despair. He now remembered all that the book had told him about the judgment seat and about the prison house. When he looked at his garden, the weeds seemed now more numerous, more luxuriant than those in any other garden. Those plants which he had been so fond of looking at and to which he had trusted for a right to be admitted into the palace seemed to have faded away, or were quite choked up by some new weeds, such as despair, hatred of the Father's holiness, and others like them, while at the same time the strong hand of sickness prevented him from even attempting to make his garden better. He could only be still and look through the door into the dark wood and imagine that he saw his father's eyes bent upon him with a look of terrible displeasure, and that he already heard the awful words pronounced, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Oh, Mama, and did he go through the door? No, my love, his father had pity on him and determined to give him another opportunity of doing right. And he commanded sickness to loosen his grasp and to set him free. And sickness obeyed the command. Gradually, the iron hand pressed less and less heavily. At last, it was removed altogether. Felix was once more at liberty. Oh, Mama, how happy he would be when he felt that the strong hand was gone and that he could go away from the door and work in his garden or play with his companions. It was a great relief, but yet Felix could scarcely be called happy. He could not forget the terrible alarm that he, he had felt. He could not forget that, although he had been suffered to escape for this time, yet a day must come when he must pass through the door, must stand before the judgment seat, and must hear the terrible sentence pronounced. 
and all he now cared for, the only thing he was now anxious about, was to put his garden in the right order to root out the hateful weeds and to plant the right plants. But this was not easy. The very sight of his garden was enough to drive him to despair. Everywhere, nothing but weeds met his eye. Here was a corner crowded with rank nettles. There another filled with the broad-leaved dock, with its strong, deep-spreading root. On one side, tall thistles seemed to lift up their heads in proud contempt of his efforts to extirpate them. On another, brambles and briars which tore his hands and clothes when he tried to touch them. And everywhere, low, creeping weeds of every various kind, which, with their long-rooted tendrils, supported and strengthened one another to resist him. But the worst of all was a weed with long, fibrous, matted roots, which seemed impossible to kill. Sometimes when Felix thought he had quite destroyed it in one place, it would immediately make its appearance in quite a new place, sending up shoots as strong and vigorous as ever. Oh, Mama, interrupted Henry eagerly, that is like the bishop weed. Even when you dig up the whole plot of ground, you often cannot get rid of it. But some of its tiresome fibrous roots will begin to grow again and send out new roots and shoots in every direction. It must be very like this weed, then, which so vexed poor Felix, and which was just as difficult to kill. Its name was ungodliness, and he well knew that it was particularly hateful to his father. And yet, with all his efforts, he never could succeed in destroying it. Neither did he find less difficulty in his attempts to prepare the ground for the reception of good seed of fruit, fruitful plants. The soil was of that stiff, clayey kind, which it is so particularly difficult to bring into order. He used a sharp spade called the fear of punishment. <laughs> and he contrived it with it to dig tolerably deep, but he could by no means break the large clods which his spade turned up. The more he beat or cut them, the harder and more compact did they become. After days of hard labor, the ground was no more fit for seed than it had been but only looked more disorderly and unsightly than before. Felix threw his spade from him in deep despair and resolved to make no more efforts to improve his garden, but to endeavor to forget his fears in the company of his former playfellows and in the pursuit of those pleasures and amusements in which he had formerly so greatly delighted. If I must be miserable hereafter, he said, at least let me be happy while I can. Boy, we heard that before. He sought out his favorite companions, frequented the most pleasant and beautiful walks, and engaged in all the most amusing games and diversions, but in vain. He could not forget. Above the merry voices and laughter of his playfellows, above the sweet song of birds, Above every sound of joy or kindness, still sounded in his ears that terrible voice pronouncing the dread sentence, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Amidst the most beautiful scenes of the garden, still could he see nothing but the open door leading into the dark, gloomy forest. Or worse still, that fearful prison house. At night, when wearied and exhausted, he lay down, hoping to forget his misery in sleep. Then he would be rendered still more wretched by the thought. There will be no rest, no sleep in the prison house. 
Every little sorrow was aggravated by the reflection. There will be nothing but sorrow in the prison house. And the words, in the prison house, I shall never know happiness, seemed to forbid him to enjoy even the most innocent pleasure. The kindness and affection of his friends only reminded him of the malice, the hatred that would forever reign there. In short, every little thing that happened, whether good or bad, seemed only to bring more clearly before his mind the horrors which he felt were awaiting him. And now a time came when Felix could no longer even try to forget when these thoughts of his lost hopeless condition so pressed upon his mind that he could think of nothing else and could do nothing but wander up and down in the most solitary parts of the garden, wringing his hands and crying, Lost and undone forever! I am lost forever! One day, while he was thus lamenting, suddenly he heard a still small voice which whispered in his ear, Thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thine help. Then was Felix exceedingly amazed. Who speaks to me of help or hope, he cried. Who shall be a help to me, miserable, undone sinner that I am? Oh, that I might know. Oh, that one would teach me where help is to be found. Again came the still small voice and whispered, Ask, and ye shall receive. Seek, and ye shall find. Now Felix knew that these words were in the book of directions. He had often heard them before, and he had liked to hear them. He had thought them pleasant, kind words, but I don't think he had ever, ne had ever really believed them. Indeed, I don't know that he had ever thought about them enough to know whether he believed them or not. But now, when his heart was full of grief and fear, they sounded to him like life from the dead, and throwing himself upon the ground, he cried, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Lord, open mine eyes that they may see. Open my ears that they may hear. And suddenly a bright light shone around about him, and when he looked, he saw before him one as it had been slain. And he was clothed with light, clothed with light as with a garment, and his face was as the sun shining in his strength. Then Felix trembled, then did Felix tremble, and was exceedingly afraid. But the shining one drew near and laid his hand on him and said, Fear not, it is I. Who art thou, Lord? said the trembling boy. I am he that was dead and am alive, and behold, I live forevermore. I am he who was slain for thine offenses and was raised again for thy justification. And I come, I am come to reconcile thee to my, thy father. I am come to reconcile thee to thy father. To reconcile me, cried Felix. Ah, Lord, how can that be? Hast thou seen my garden? Full of every hateful weed and with not a single one of the plants which my father has commanded me to cultivate. Dost thou not know the terrible handwriting that is against me in the Father's book of remembrance? How can that fearful record of sins be ever blotted out? I have taken away the handwriting that was against you. I have blotted out as with a thick cloud thy sins, said the Holy One in a voice full of love and tenderness. But Lord, how can this be? Has not my father sworn by his holiness that he will not let the sinner go unpunished? Ah, Lord, surely he cannot lie. And thou hast not read, Felix, how I, thine elder brother, have borne the punishment of thy sins in thy stead, how upon me has been laid all thine iniquity? 
and I have borne all the wrath that was due to thee, so that now thy father is faithful and just to forgive thy sins, which have been punished in me. Now he will no longer require from thee the debt which I have paid. Then was Felix filled with joy and thankfulness to hear that the terrible punishment had been borne for him. And how did he rejoice to hear that all the handwriting that was against him was taken away? With what a full heart did he kneel down and worship him who had borne all his sins and iniquity? Oh, Mama, cried little Henry, I am so glad to think how Felix must have rejoiced. Now he got all he wished. Now he would be no longer afraid. No, he was no longer afraid of punishment, dear Henry. But still he had not got all he wished for. At one time he had desired nothing beyond freedom from punishment. Formerly he had not cared at all about his father's love. He had desired above all things to keep out of his sight, to forget him, and to be forgotten by him. Boy, don't we all go through that. But now, when he heard that his father had so loved him as to send his well-beloved son to suffer in his stead, he could not rest satisfied with mere forgiveness. He now desired, ah, how earnestly, to have his father's love. His soul fainted with the longing it had for his father, father's presence and blessing. But he felt that such desires were vain. How could he hope to see his father smile upon him, to know his, that his father loved him, who had so rebelled against a father of such goodness? No, it could not be. All he could expect was freedom from punishment. He could never, never deserve to be restored to his father's favor. And as he felt this, the joyful look faded from his eyes and his countenance became again sad. Now his elder brother knew what it was that thus saddened the heart of the poor sinful child, and he drew near to him and put his arms round him and laid his weary, aching head upon his own loving breast and said, It is true, Felix. You can never, never deserve your father's love. But... I have deserved it, and all I have deserved, I freely give to you. Amen. You have no holiness of your own, but I am all holy, and I clothe you in my holiness, and my Father looks upon you, thus clothed, and loves you for the sake of what I have given you. I have fulfilled all righteousness, and as I have taken you to myself and count you as a part of myself, so all my righteousness is counted as yours. And for its sake, the Father will love you even as he loves me. Oh, Mama, what a great thing, as he loves him, exclaimed Henry. A great thing indeed, Henry, but true, is it not? Yes, Mama, but somehow one does not think of it. Ah, no, Henry, none of us think of it as we should. You did not think much or feel much this morning when you repeated to me these blessed words of our Lord, and thou hast loved them as thou hast loved me. And yet, my darling boy, what words these are, as thou hast loved me. Oh, Mama was all Henry could say. The tears rose to his eyes. And boy-like, ashamed of his emotion, he hid his face upon his mama's shoulder. She did not speak. She was glad, thankful to see how much her boy felt this glorious, tr glorious truth. And she lifted her heart in prayer to God for a blessing upon him. After some minutes, Henry said, But mama... 
Had Felix never heard of his elder brothers bearing his punishment and working out a righteousness for him? Yes, he had heard it often. As I said about the promise, Ask and ye shall receive. He had liked to hear about it. It had been to him like a pleasant song or a beautiful story. But he had never thought much about it. It had never seemed real to him until now. When he saw that loving elder brother before him, when he felt his arms around him and knew that he would never let him go, never let anything hurt him. Okay, I'm going to stop right here on page 100. I have about 20 pages to go. I know I'm reading very slowly, but it's a lot easier for me to do so. Um, I hope uh, that this uh, leaves you well, and uh, I hope this feeds your heart and soul.